Hey, Steve Stein from Guitar Zoom here. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, what we're going to be doing is reminiscing about Steve Grimmett from Grim Reaper, my friend Steve, who unfortunately has recently passed away. And, um, you know, it's just, it's always difficult when you lose somebody that you're close to, that you love, and um, that you've made a lot of memories with. And unfortunately, Steve passed away while I and my family were on vacation. So, you know, there was just a, a lot of time to think and reflect while, you know, driving. We were, we were, you know, 12 to 14 hours away from home. And so there was a lot of driving and, you know, contacting Steve's family and, you know, friends and, just, you know, trying to enjoy the, the vacation as best we could, yet knowing that, you know, Steve had passed away right at the beginning of our vacation. And then the day we left, unfortunately, Jess's grandmother passed away as well. So, you know, the, the thing of should you stay, you know, home, do you still go because you've already, you know, paid for all the hotels and everything and you know, we just came to the conclusion that we, we needed to move forward and try the best we could to enjoy the vacation. So anyway, what I thought would be kind of nice is to give you some insight. If you didn't know Steve personally, what kind of person Steve was. And I'm actually going to be playing you some music that um, some Grimstein music and some unreleased Grimstein music as well. Some of it is a little bit raw uh, because it wasn't fully mixed and produced and mastered. We, we didn't get that far. I've got a lot of stuff, but I'm not going to be playing all of it. I'm just going to play a couple little things for you. But, um, you know, I want to start off by just talking about Steve and the the first time I met him and just kind of go from there and let you, you know, know what kind of guy... Steve was. So it must have been back in 2006, 2007. I'm thinking 2006, but I'm not sure. Uh, Steve had actually married a, a girl from the United States that lived uh, close to where I am from, from Fargo, North Dakota. And at the time, I was in a band called Dozer, and we were... Uh, uh, quite popular, to be honest with you. You know, we would do cover tunes. We didn't really do any originals. We had a few originals, but it, it was more the the entertainment of the show itself. You know, we we were fun and funny and um, <laughs> spontaneous and, you know, kind of crazy. And people just loved, you know, not just the music, but the entertainment that we were. Um, you know, we had shirts that we sold that said, like, uh, more talk, less rock and, uh, you know, entertainment of all sizes. Cause I'm five foot two and, you know, the drummer was, you know, six foot four or something like that. I don't know exactly how tall he was. So we would just, we, we were kind of a fun band. Well, one morning we, we were playing a weekend in Fargo and I got a call from a friend of mine at the radio station that Steve Grimmett was in town and was coming out to one of our shows with his wife at the time. And, uh, so we got prepared, you know, sometimes when you meet people who had a bout with large amounts of fame, and then maybe they're not as famous then as they, they were at some point, you know, they're jaded and, you know, you just run into this in the industry, unfortunately. And so I had no idea what kind of person Steve Grimm was going to be. So we were all prepared to, uh, to just do our usual craziness and um, so we, we start playing. Steve walks in with his then wife and sits down and, you know, just is just sitting there and with, with everybody else. And so we're doing our thing. We go on break and I go to get a drink. And Steve actually comes up to me and he says something along the lines of, man, I haven't heard guitar playing like that in so long. You were you were absolutely amazing. And it just immediately, my guard dropped, you know, and so we started talking. And, you know, every time we would go on break, he and I would get together again and talk. And then after the show, we kept talking. And he was just the sweetest guy. He was just so nice. And 
funny and you know so we immediately started talking about collaboration like this is the first time i've ever met this guy and we exchanged numbers we're talking about doing some musical collaborations and i mentioned to him that i'm going to be getting married in scotland he's from england of course a swindon england and uh so I mentioned to him, you know, I'm going to be getting married in, in Scotland. I don't remember how long the, the time was from when I met him to where we were getting married. I don't, it wasn't very long, you know, maybe six months, maybe not even. I, I can't, I can't honestly remember, but, and he's like, oh man, that's so great. I would love to, to come to your wedding. So I'm like, well, I think, I think that would be awesome. So anyway, we get done, you know, the next day we're calling each other. And I talked to my wife, and she's like, yeah, it'd be great to have him at the wedding. And so, you know, nobody else, we get married, my wife and I and my oldest daughter are the only ones at this wedding in Scotland, at Edinburgh Castle, if you know what that is. And I'm going to be wearing a kilt, and it's, you know, the whole the whole thing. And so the second time I meet Steve is he comes down or comes up to Scotland, to stay at the castle and be my best man. And we're going to play some songs at the wedding. So <laughs> I should give you a little bit of backstory too, because, you know, I started playing guitar in when I was 13 at 19, this would have been 1983. And learning albums like Back in Black and High and Dry, you know, actual albums, like I would learn by ear. That's how I learned how to play was just putting on records and listening to them and then figuring out riffs. Well, one of the albums that was absolutely life-changing for me was See You in Hell. And so learning, you know, these bands, these albums back in the day and sitting there and learning Nick Bocott's riffs and trying to learn his solos and, and all this stuff by ear, you know, that, that album was huge for me. And so... It was just kind of surreal to all of a sudden meet Steve and, you know, having this background of learning these songs, you know, being a big Grim Reaper fan back in the day. And and then, you know, he's going to be at my wedding, at our wedding. And so, you know, he shows up and and <laughs> we go out and we, we're taking photos and doing the whole thing and hanging out like we've known each other forever. You know, we had talked on the phone all, all the time after I met him. We were always talking. And so we're going to do some collaboration stuff that becomes the Grimstein album. If you haven't heard it, you can go to Spotify or, you know, Apple Music or whatever and find it. And you can listen to it. I'm very, very proud of it, by the way. But so in the process of between when I met him to our wedding, we're working on songs. Like, we're just constantly working on some ideas. And I had, and I always have, just a ton of different ideas of things that I work on. So, in the early days of the Grimstein stuff, I would send him these these songs that I was working on. And you have to understand, at that time, I was always working on instrumental material. I'm always working on different instrumental stuff. So, the songs are geared toward having a lot of guitar parts. Obviously, because there's no singer. So, I'm sending him these these early tracks... And he's like, dude, I, I love this stuff. I love these songs. He didn't actually say dude, but he goes, I love, love these songs. But there's nowhere for me to sing. Like, they're, they're really thick with guitar stuff. So that was really the, the, the first indication to me of learning how to write, leaving room for a singer. Now, I had written with other bands before, but you were always in the same room or in the same town or something like that. Here, I'm in America, he's over in England, and so I started learning how to write, leaving space for him to do his thing. And one of the first songs that we wrote, which I'm actually going to play you a little bit of, it's it's it never it didn't go on the album or anything like that, and it's it's you know pretty raw, but it's it's a song called "Dirty Little Little Girl." And this was one of the, the first riffs I came up with. And you're going to see how, like with Steve and myself, when we first started writing stuff, it was kind of bluesy. Like, I have a lot of this stuff that was more blues-based. And if you know Steve, you know some of his other work, like Lion's Heart and some of those things. 
you know, he had a very blues rock kind of background. It wasn't just metal. Like, he liked all kinds of different things. And a lot of the unreleased material that I have of Grimstein is a lot of mellow stuff. Because for Steve and myself, it wasn't just writing metal things because he was in Grim Reaper. He wanted to explore all kinds of different things, major key songs, you know, just different stuff like that. So this song, I thought I would play you a little bit and just show you kind of where we were at the time and, you know, give you a sense of, of these these early demos. So this is one of the first, I think this is actually the first song that we wrote together. So let me play it for you. Okay, so anyway, you get the idea. So the way this would work is, you know, I would I would come up with these riffs, and usually it wasn't just a riff. Usually I'd come up with, like, full-blown sections of things. Now, when you're working with somebody, if you've written music before, unless you have the whole song planned out in your mind, you don't really know what's going to be a verse or what's going to be a chorus or, you know, you might have an idea. But with Steve... Oftentimes, I would send him something, and his perception of what he wanted to be the chorus might be very different than what I was thinking when I was writing the thing. So basically, the way it would work is I would come up with these different sections to the song, and, you know, what I would perceive as an intro and a verse and a chorus or whatever, and then I would send it to him, and then what he would do is he would take that song and then cut it if he needed to. Sometimes he didn't even need to, but sometimes, most of the time... He would cut the parts and then move them around, right? So we're talking early demo stuff here where I'm just using, you know, a drum machine or, you know, drum software or something like that. Uh, and it's just him and I working this up. And so he would kind of move it around or, you know, if he wanted a double section to sing over, he would just, you know, copy and paste it twice, whatever. And then he would sing his part over the top. And I got to tell you, the craziest thing for me because Steve, we all know Steve had an amazing voice, but Steve had an amazing ability for songwriting and coming up with hooks and coming up with stories, you know, and, and I think that's, that's the other part that sometimes we forget because we just think of like, you know, See You in Hell and Rock You to Hell and whatever those things are. And they're, again, no disrespect, those are great songs. But if you gave him the right music, he could just kind of go and it would give me goosebumps. I would I would be so excited when he would email me back a song that he worked on. You know, my wife and I would just sit there and like as soon as he would send me something back because it wasn't Dirty Little Girl when I sent it to him, right? Or it wasn't whatever the song was. Again, this is early stuff, but you get the idea. It was just a, a thing that I came up with. When he sent it back to me, it was a song. And... I, I just, I always enjoyed that feeling of getting something back from him and going, oh my God, there it is. Like, there's something. And then, you know, we would, we would work it out and, you know, figure out what the next thing was going to be. 
And so, you know, that song was just an early, I, I have all kinds of different stuff like this, but you get the idea. So another song that we started working on was a song called Two Steps Behind. Now this one made it on, I don't remember if it was a Japanese pressing or something like that. It wasn't, it wasn't on all the, uh, all the releases. So this was an earlier one too. And I thought, again, it'll be fun to just kind of show you this. So this is a, another early Grimstein idea, me throwing him something and him throwing it back to me. Again, you can see the the early stages of it. This is somewhat similar to the last song. So we were working with this bluesy swing thing because again, that was Steve just loved that bluesy vibe to to music. You know, he was a big Thin Lizzy fan. There was all kinds of different stuff that he was really into. Um, but it wasn't just metal. You know, he he enjoyed all these different kinds of of grooves and things. So that kind of grew out of there. And again, I'm not going to play you all this stuff, but you get the idea. So, you know, so we're playing together. We're writing some of these songs, you know, trying to kind of find our, um, our voice, if you will, for this band. And you have to understand at this time too, he wasn't doing Grim Reaper. He wasn't really doing much of anything. He was, you know, he had a, a regular job and, and, you know, we were just kind of getting back into this. He's getting back into doing some stuff. And, and then the wedding comes. So the, so at the wedding, uh, you know, he shows up and, you know, he's got a room at the castle. And, uh, the next day, you know, you can see pictures online, you know, and, and things like that of, of he and I too. I, I know on Facebook, there's a post I made for his, his passing where I've got a couple different pictures of, of, uh, us at the, at the castle. But, you know, he shows up and he's just, you know, hugging me and he's just, is so happy and we were, we had so much fun and so you know he's my best man we play uh you know i know edwin mccain all be we played there was a couple other ones we played at the wedding too but i know we played that one and so you know we do the wedding and after the wedding we're hanging out and he's like you know my wife and i have all these plans and my my daughter at the time uh, my daughter, she's still my daughter, but you know, she was very young at the time, but so it's us three and, and, and he's like, you know, we had all these plans for doing stuff in Scotland. And he's like, you know, we'd love to take you back to England and hang out with, with us and our friends and, you know, celebrate. So we jump in a car in their car and we go back to England and we spend the rest of the vacation, the rest of the, our, our wedding vacation, hanging out with them, just doing all kinds of different stuff, meet his family, uh, you know, hanging out with his brothers and, and, you know, just the whole thing. And it was, it was absolutely incredible. And then they, they flew us back to Scotland 
And then we, of course, we left, you know, we went back home. And then that's where he and I started working on the rest of the Grimstein stuff, which became, you know, the album. And again, I have other, other, you know, songs that didn't make it on the album, but I just find it interesting because if you listen to that album, if you've ever heard the Grimstein album, it's kind of all over the place and it was intended to be that way. It wasn't just supposed to be straightforward metal. Um, and so you've got songs like 911 and Supernatural, which were pretty, pretty heavy rock. And then you have stuff like, uh, got nothing but time that are a little more mellow or you'll never know that's really mellow. Um, you know, there's just all kinds of stuff. One of his favorite songs. And, and again, I would, I would advise you to listen to the album if you haven't heard it before. But I'm trying to show you some stuff that show other sides of Steve. You already know the heavy side of Steve and there are heavy songs on that. But one of his favorite songs on that album was a major key song that we did, which was just so different. And I thought I would play you a little bit of that as well. Uh, it's called Till They Take My Wings. And he always really enjoyed this one, which I always thought was interesting because it's, it's again, so different. But uh, let me show you. Yeah. Say that I can't do no more I can't follow any dreams Now I can't wish upon a star Or breathe the clean air or so it seems Since the day that I was told It doesn't look like I'm getting old So in the morning I'll be gone You know, and I'd love to play you all of this, but I don't want to just take all your time. But again, I, it, it just gives me goosebumps when I hear his voice because he was just, he had such a wonderful voice and such a, a way with words. And I think it's so interesting, Till They Take My Wings is what this is called. You know, these songs about the limited amount of time that we have on this earth. And as most of you probably know, you know, he was, uh, he, he flew model airplanes and just loved doing that. And, and some of these songs... You know, I can see where he was coming from with some of these things, you know, till they take my wings. Anyway, it's just it's always interesting for me to go back and listen to these songs because I just I remember him sending them over and just just being taken by his voice and and these songs. I, I do want to play you another little bit of one again, because these are all Grimstein songs. I don't think I'm going to get a copyright strike because <laughs> There are songs, but you never know, right? So I'm I'm trying not to play this whole thing. But there's a song on the album that when my wife was pregnant with our second daughter, which is Imogen, Immy we call her, we decided, he and I decided to write a song for Immy. And the song is called To Sing a Lullaby. And I remember when Immy was born, I'll give you a little backstory but with this. When Immy was born, she didn't cry. She just made these little kind of cooing sounds. And so I recorded those cooing sounds. And and that's what you hear at the very beginning of the song. You hear the actual cooing sounds that she would make when she was first born. And I sent over this song to Steve, the the the, the you know, the, the chords to it, and Steve sent back the song with these words to sing a lullaby. And he was like, he he told me. He goes, I think this is the greatest song I've ever, I've ever written. And I think he meant that because it was so heartfelt. Like, and, and my wife and I, all we would, and Steve would too, like Steve would tell me, he would cry when he would listen to the song. Well, my wife and I, for the first like two months, every time we'd listen to the song, we'd just cry because it, it's so beautiful. And then just to give you the recap of the end of the song, at the end of the song is one of Emmy's first actual cries. So at the end of the song, you hear her cry for the first time. 
the beginning you hear, or, or one of the first times, you hear her cooing, and then at the end you hear her crying. So let me play a little bit of this to sing a lullaby. So, you know, that it, it just shows all the, uh, there's just so many sides to, to Steve. So when this album got released, uh, a couple friends of mine, Dave Johnson and Sean Bow here from Fargo, North Dakota, supplied bass and, and drums to the songs. And Grimstein got released in 2008. And, you know, we, we shopped around the album and, you know, there were a couple of things that we passed on that maybe we shouldn't have but you know it got picked up by some different labels to get released and which was great and you know some of them as i explained before had bonus tracks and whatever but you know we we never wound up being able to get uh, an actual tour together him being over there us being over here and but what it did do is it it ignited steve to want to get back into doing the grim reaper stuff and because he was just, you know, he was on fire with writing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, he wound up getting back into doing the Grim Reaper stuff, which was awesome. And while he was doing the Grim Reaper stuff, you know, he and I kept writing Grimstein stuff. And I have a bunch of different things. It's just they're not done. You know, there's 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 some songs that are done, but there's a lot of stuff that we did that, you know, I've had different versions of songs. I'm still trying to dig out and find you know, where I had him singing a certain way, and then he, you know, would sing it a different way, and, you know, and I can't find him, you know, because you got to remember, back in the early days, you know, now it's 2022 when I'm doing this, you know, back in 2010 or 2012, the technology of sending stuff back and forth was still a little sketchy, you know, you'd use a, 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 a cloud site, and then it would be gone, you know, and then you didn't have that anymore. You know, now we often use things like Dropbox or whatever it might be. And these things seem like they're going to be here forever. Well, back in those days, they weren't. And so, you know, we just we just never finished some of those things. He wound up getting busy. I wound up getting, you know, the the um, obviously the guitar zoom thing that I do now, you know, started taking off. So he was doing his thing. I was doing my thing. We would do, you know, the Grimstein stuff when we had time. 
and maybe some of this stuff will see the light of day and and maybe it won't we haven't you know i haven't figured that out with it with millie his wife yet but you know we'll we'll figure it out but i just wanted to give you some ideas of what it was like you know knowing steve and and being with him and he was just always such a such a kind-hearted guy you know my wife and i would go to to england to visit millie and steve and you know, sometimes we we just sit and watch TV. You know, I remember watching Doctor Who one time. We just watched seasons of Doctor Who just sitting there. And he and I were always big fans of uh, Eddie Murphy. You know, we would call each other and, and do Eddie Murphy jokes from like Raw, if you know Eddie Murphy. You know, so we'd just go back and forth and back and forth with these jokes of, of Eddie Murphy stuff. And, you know, just that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I was the best man at his wedding. And and we we played songs at his wedding. He was the the godfather of my daughter Imogen, you know, which I, I you know I'm I'm it's not like I'm skimming by these things, but I'm just talking uh, therapeutically. I think for myself more than anything. And you know these are just all kinds of different things. He came to America when when Imogen was uh, baptized. <laughs> and we in this little town that my my wife is from. And I remember there was a buffet. They called it at the time, they called it a smorgasbord, right? Some of you might know that term. And I remember Steve kept saying, what the hell is a smorgasbord? I'm like, well, it's like a buffet, you know, where you could just eat all kinds of things. But he just thought that the, the term smorgasbord was hilarious because he had never heard that before. And uh, But, you know, he'd been in America on tour with Grim Reaper back in the day. So he knew how to drive, you know, on in America, drive, you know, on the quote unquote wrong side of the road, if you will. And, uh, you know, drive a car where the steering wheel is on the right hand side, where in England, you know, the steering wheel is on the left hand side. He was very comfortable with all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we'd laugh about different kinds of foods that we would have that they didn't have or weren't popular, certainly weren't popular in England. And, you know, just all kinds of different things like that. And he was always so funny. You know, he had a great sense of humor. And, you know, he struggled with things. Certainly, you know, after he, uh, got sick and lost his leg. He struggled uh, with different things psychologically and physically and emotionally. And um, but he, you know, he 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 was still always there when you needed to talk about something. And uh, you know, I just loved him so much. I think he's just such an amazing person and and wonderful friend. And, you know, through knowing Steve, I remember going to a show, uh, a Grim Reaper show in Chicago and meeting up with Nick Bocott. You know, Nick came out to uh, do a song with them. And that's when I first met Nick. And then, you know, Nick and I developed a friendship, uh, you know, over the over the years. I, he was working at Marshall and then he, he got a job working over at Sweetwater Well, I was doing you know, with some of the endorsements that I have and stuff, I was doing um, some clinics out at Sweetwater for an event that they have. And, you know, so I got to see Nick again. We, you know, kept in touch, whatever. And then when the, the COVID thing hit, you know, everybody was locked down and and I, you know, got a hold of Steve and I'm like, we should do some stuff, you know. I would love to get a hold of some different musicians and and you know, keep people busy and keep their minds on music and, and not, you know, you know, just all the terrible things that happened when everybody was in lockdown. Steve's like, I think that's a wonderful idea. And so we started doing some different collaborations. Now I did collaborations with a lot of different people, but certainly I did a lot of them with Steve. And so I, one of the things that we decided to do is I, I asked him, I said, would you ever be interested in working with Nick again? Because they hadn't worked together since, you know, the early Grim Reaper stuff. And uh, had a bit of a falling out and then came back together, and as happens. And I said, would you be interested in doing a song, you know, with, with Nick? And he's like, yeah, I think that would be great. And so we wound up doing, I believe it was Heaven and Hell was the first one we did. Again, we've done so many of them, but I think it was Heaven and Hell was the first one that we did together that brought Steve and Nick b back together on, you know, musically. And so... You know, I did the mixing of that and, and everything like that, and and it got them, you know, connected back together musically. You know, I don't know if they talked outside of that. That's none of my business. But, um, you know, so we, Nick and myself and, and a couple other of my friends, uh, Joel Stevenette and uh, Brian Hollenbeck, would, would make some of these videos and 
and these songs and people seem to enjoy them and it kept us going through the COVID stuff. And unfortunately, you know, for Steve, he just never got after COVID, you know, having been sick and lost his leg and the COVID stuff and all the shutdown stuff and the finances and how expensive things were. And he just unfortunately never got to get back out and start touring again. You know, he did some shows here and there, which was awesome. But he just really never got to get back out and, and do a lot of stuff. Certainly never came back to North America uh, for us to see each other again. And, you know, I talked to him all the time online. You know, we text each other all the time. And, you know, he was telling me back in June or July, he was telling me that he was having heart problems and that they had a monitor on. But it was so sweaty, you know, it was so hot over in England that, you know, the, the heart monitor would, would fall off sometimes. And, you know, if you know anything about England, a, a lot of places in England don't have air conditioning. So when it gets hot, there's there's not much you can do. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, we lost Steve. And so I just I just wanted to, to give you some insight into uh, Steve as a as a as a person and what a what a lovely man he was, what a sweet person he was. And what a talent he was, and that I was just, I miss him so much, and I love him, and I love his family, um, you know, his his kids and, and his, his wife, and anyway, so I wanted to end uh, with this song. I just, I find it amazing how appropriate it is for, if I can find, there it is, listen to this song, listen to the words of this song, and and it's called Final Flight. And I'll, I'll end with this and just thank you for for listening. And, you know, if you know anybody who's a Steve Grimm fan, please share this podcast and let them hear some insight into the the beautiful soul that is uh, Steve Grimmett. So here's here's Final Flight. Thank you, and, and I'll see you soon, okay? Don't grieve for me, and now I'm gone.
softly in the wind Remember me and the things that we once did This love we shared and with laughter and a kiss Oh yes, these things I will miss So lift your heart as I take my final flight Final flight. So think of me as I take my final flight.